I have a reading to begin to explore this idea of covenant. It's by Donald Skinner, and it was published in the denominational UU World magazine several years ago. One of the first things that visitors see when they walk into the building of Westside UU Congregation in Seattle, Washington, is Westside's covenant of right relations. The covenant, a set of guidelines designed to create a, quote, welcoming, respectful, safe, and vibrant spiritual community, was adopted in 2007. Not because the congregation had a problem to address, but because it believed a covenant might prevent such problems. Quote, what we can say is that having a covenant has helped our board and our other leaders think about how to handle a conflict, says the Reverend Peg Morgan, who came to Westside in 2002. The heart of the covenant is that besides expressing our emotions and the differences in respectful ways, we approach disagreements constructively by talking to the person that we have an issue with, not with the third person. The covenant calls members to listen attentively, express gratitude, value confidentiality, ask for help, respect different opinions, and, quote, acknowledge that everyone makes mistakes, close quote. As the congregation has grown, it has 147 men members, the covenant has become more important, says Morgan. We were a family-sized congregation when I came, we have fairly rapidly doubled in size. In, and in that kind of growth, communications always gets more complicated. We wanted to put into place some good understandings for how to respond to our differences. Noting that covenants sometimes get done and then forgotten, Westside strives for visibility. Besides sitting in a frame on a table, a covenant is included in every orientation packet and is discussed with newcomers and invoked at each congregational meeting. Westside also created a compassionate congregation committee to respond to conflict situations. There is another reason for adopting a covenant besides simply helping to ensure congregational harmony. It is to keep it healthy so that it will be there for others. As one minister said, this faith of ours has given us great gifts and it's also given us responsibilities to make the community available to others. And we can do that best by pouring our hearts and souls and treasure into making the fellowship strong and vital. In the first two sermons of this series on promises, I looked at the promises we make to ourselves and then the promises we make to other people in our lives. This week and next Sunday in a youth-led service, we're going to talk about the promises we make together as people in community. Whenever people gather, it is natural to have a set of understandings, expectations, and even rules. As individuals, we need to know what kinds of behaviors and attitudes are okay and what kinds aren't. Knowing the culture gives us some confidence to move around with a higher degree of freedom. We get to know the lay of the land. I expect most of you know what I mean, especially those of you who are new today, for every one of us has on many occasions gone into a new situation, probably with a fair amount of anxiety, exactly because we don't know what to expect or what is expected of us. Perhaps it's the first day on a new job or walking into a church for the first time. Maybe it's going to dinner with people you don't know or the first time that you met the family of your sweetheart or your child's sweetheart. Nothing causes a rise in anxiety like being a stranger in the crowd, the new kid in the school. Perhaps you've had the good fortune to travel to very unfamiliar cultures for a short time or even long enough to say that you have lived there. What are the customs? What are the taboos? Am I inadvertently offending someone? During World War II, the U.S. Army used to furnish its invasion troops with small booklets that included local customs and the pl of the places they were landing. A few basic phrases, perhaps a couple of sites they might see if they had time off, and reminders that the Army should act with courtesy and good manners. 
which is an interesting contradiction, but never mind. Wouldn't it be so much easier when we go into new situations if we were handed a sheet of customs and expectations any time you walked into a new place? The structures, formal and informal, that shape our cultures and our communities can be quite complex or very relaxed. Each understood agreement can suffice for a huge population or for very small and intimate groups. In cities, provinces, and nations, we might call the governing ethos of behavior the social contract. It can come with an attendant set of laws designed to protect us from those who would violate that contract. And sometimes we need to be reminded of the values included in that social contract. Since the last American presidential election, one of the great concerns has been that their social contract is being changed dramatically, ripped apart. Racism exists, as it does everywhere, but it was never officially sanctioned, or not for a long time. But increasingly, in presidential tweets and in court cases like we saw this week using the police, regarding the police use of force, racial equality seems to be threatened, if not actually being destroyed. It was very disturbing, and it's ripping up the social contract. In Canada, with a certain degree of contrast, we're trying to come to terms with our racism, particularly against First Nations people. That was an unspoken part of our social contract for well, most of 150 years. We sought to address the problem history through truth and reconciliation work. We are trying to bring our behaviors and policies into line with public statements that celebrate our diversities. It will take a very long time. It will be a trying time. But I, for one, at least see small progressive steps being taken. Now, perhaps the best example I can cite comes from a most unlikely source, the Canadian Football League. In the wake of the neo-Nazi riots that happened in the United States a little while ago, the famous Tiki Torch riots, there already had been program and work for diversity is strength, a program that they were going to roll out later in the year. But the great thing is when those riots happened, the CFL acted immediately. And at the Sunday game in Winnipeg, they had T-shirts in place uh, that said diversity is our strength. And on the back, it's really cool. It has the names of 26 players from A to Z, all from different cultures in different uh, parts of the world. And they managed to get this public service announcement floating as well that day. As diverse as a country, a league of Jacksons and Kwongs, Eliminians and Messams, Moscas, Custises, Sinopolis, Shigares and Burrises, a league of Reeds, Reiches, O'Shea's and Awusuansas, a league where what makes each of us different makes all of us stronger. Most of you who have been around for a while know that I'm a fairly sappy guy. And when I saw that commercial for the first time, tears were streaming down my cheeks. Because if you don't know me, I am something of a football fan. The simple ad, ad was designed to reinforce a basic premise of our social contract. We are a welcoming nation that holds all people to have the same rights and freedoms here. And it takes a step further, suggesting that we all have an equal opportunity to prove ourselves. This is our contract. This is our covenant. But of course, as a society, we often fail. But failure should be the reason to reaffirm the covenant and to start again. Failure is not a reason to dismiss our aspirations and give up. You've several times heard me in this series refer to the Hebrew Bible as a collection of stories about covenants broken, made, broken, and remade between Yahweh and the Hebrew people. And the key word is remade. There was never a giving up. That's the way covenant works. It starts with a goal, like we're all going to get along for mutual prosperity and safety. A set of customs are developed 
in support of that goal. And some we manage to keep and others get tested by tempers, by greed, by some people feeling trapped in this particular social structure because no social structure fits everyone. The covenant must be remade and reconsidered regularly. It has to be a living thing. Treaties have to be living things. Beliefs have to be living things. The Unitarian Universalist Association in the United States describes the term covenant thusly. It is Latin for come together and means solemn agreement or promise from the heart regarding a course of action between parties. A promise from the heart. That really should be big stuff. A promise from the heart. And we all know that heart promises have to be reaffirmed often because none of us are perfect. But in truth, these days, covenants are falling out of favor. We live in a rather individualistic society. As I mentioned last week, a new dimension of that individualism is the widespread existence of easily dismissed promises. There is The example I cited is that there's a growing habit of saying, sure, I'll show up to all kinds of events and then blowing them off when something better comes along and doing it guilt-free. Also, as members of a society, fewer and fewer of us are making lasting commitments. Jobs and careers are not for life anymore for lots of different reasons. The idea of loyalty is on the wane. It's been replaced by dedication to immediate interest. An idea or a group captures our imagination and we get involved, sometimes quite deeply and sometimes quite passionately. But today, fewer and fewer people ever envision staying with that commitment for a lifetime. Very few wedding vows include as long as you both shall live anymore. It's been largely replaced by as long as you both shall love. An acknowledgement that even marriage vows are not forever. A realistic (laughs) acknowledgement that marriage vows are not forever. Once people joined churches, clubs, etc. and remained with them for years, often lifetimes. But it's not so anymore. And everywhere you look, whether it's church or school or park-based sports, finding volunteers who will stay for even one season is terribly difficult. We live in a society of busy people who want to keep their free time options open. Fewer and fewer are willing to make a steady, continuing commitment. Now, to be clear, I'm offering this as an observation, not as a lament or a chastisement. Long-time organizations are having to adapt and change their covenants and find new ways to operate. That's nothing new. Social change is a constant. Now, one of the ways our congregational culture is adapting and changing is that we're moving away or shrinking standing committees to the absolutely essential ones and instead inviting volunteers to do short-term tasks and to pitch in and do a little bit of work. In fact, during the announcement period, you will be asked, I think, today to pitch in and do some short-term tasks. Of course, we do need a few people still who are going to make that commitment to work over the longer term because if we don't, then we're going to stumble along without plan or direction. And that's not healthy either. It can't all be ad hoc. Now, some people like this cultural change. Some people don't. And this can lead to a conflict now and then, sometimes a small one, sometimes a large one. Badly managed conflict can damage a community very quickly because, face it, who comes to church to get into a fight? So far, we've been lucky about that at this congregation, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But an increasing number of congregations like ours are creating covenants of right relations. And in fact, that's what our youth group is discussing upstairs and will be presenting on next week. And I believe, actually, that's where the idea got its start, in church schools and with youth groups. The rules that govern the classroom are often created collectively and include simple things like no hitting, let each person have a turn, share the crayons when asked. And we can all predict 
what these rules will be, but teachers have found that when the children generate them themselves, they become more real, more meaningful, and are more likely to be observed. When I first entered the ministry, we occasionally heard of congregations developing covenants of right relations, but it was quite rare, and it usually followed very destructive conflict that had torn things apart. Sometimes it was over the minister, sometimes it was because of a difficult personality or a clique fighting for control. There was causes of great disruptions. And as you can imagine, such conflicts had a tendency to drive people away rather rapidly. As I said, who wants to come to church to get into a fight? The answer is, some people. <laughs> A few years later, covenants started turning up in congregations that were experiencing rapid growth because growth also creates tension. Pretty much any kind of change to the culture creates some tension. The longer-term members were suddenly dealing with a startlingly new influx of people, something they always wanted but never really thought through because it required changes in programming, sometimes changes in staffing, sometimes moving to a bigger building, and most difficult at all of all, sharing the power of decision-making in the church with people who were different from us. As a church grows or shrinks, its culture changes, and new agreements must be worked out. Now, numbers-wise in this congregation, we're pretty solid. We're declining a little bit in formal membership, but that's been somewhat made up by more friends, more non-members attending on a fairly regular basis. To the best of my knowledge, the Unitarian Church of Edmonton has never had a covenant of right relations. If we ever did, it's lost in the mists of archival time. But then again, the last time this congregation had a major fight that I'm aware of was back around 1972. Or maybe we do have a covenant, but it's an unspoken one. It exists. I believe it's based on the neighborly principles of respect and welcome. And it's also based on our seven principles. And we heard a couple of people lighting candles today that were in some way affirming that unspoken covenant because their needs had been met. Mostly, our unspoken agreement seems to be built on people who try to introduce newer attenders to the culture of this place. It's not explicit, but it can be gleaned from the kinds of formal and informal welcome newcomers experience coming through the door. It could be sussed out a little by the what rituals we do on Sunday morning, the shared candles, the announcements, the coffee hour. It can be discovered by brave people asking questions or being helped to address their issues or being invited to an event or an activity or to help with the task. Now that seems to be how it works here in my observation, but the problem is that an unspoken set of rules and customs is vague and it's unclear and not everybody has the same understanding of it. You sort of have to have a feel for this kind of a culture to get it or you have to be brave enough to ask about it. And this means that we tend to attract people who are culturally kind of like us. That probably spills over to race and nationality to a degree, where people come from different cultural understandings. So perhaps it is time for our congregation to look a little more openly at the promises that we make to this community and the promises we ask others to make when they join. We might find new needs to address or unseen roadblocks we had not noticed in our own comfort. Covenants of right relations are not easy things to pop out. You can't just download one, put it up on the wall nice and pretty and say, done. It has to be a living document generated organically by and within a community, just like our children do in their programs. It takes time. And it requires broad participation and buy-in. It has to be something referenced regularly and honored in word and deed. So next week, listen to the voices of our youth, the people who we hope will inherit this church. Hear what they have done, 
and what they expect of the adult community here. Will we undertake a covenant process? I don't know. That's for you all to decide in concert with the Board of Trustees. But whether we do or not, it's good to bring the topic up and at least consider it. For even in this simple way do we subtly renew our covenants. Amen.